August 1966, the first of the Red Guard rallies in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. A million ecstatic teenagers, many of them dressed in military uniform and waving little red books, greet their idol, Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao want the support of the people, and uh, we were out there. I didn't know, should I cry or jump or say something? Catherine Ye was 13 years old when she attended that rally in Tiananmen Square. It was one of the defining moments of her youth. I felt we were in something very big, and I was trembling with excitement. And that feeling never left me, that our confined life, you know, our life was so minute and so well documented and controlled, and all of a sudden, all of this was gone. Gone to be replaced by frenzied devotion to Chairman Mao. In the minds of his teenage worshippers, Mao had lifted China out of a century of colonial enslavement, civil war and poverty. With one revolution, he'd made China free, and now with another, he would make China strong. In launching the great proletarian cultural revolution, Mao was giving the youth of China a chance to make history, and Red Guards like 16-year-old Jiang Anxi were determined that they should not be found wanting. I believed in Mao with every cell in my body. You felt you would give Chairman Mao your everything, your body, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your fate, you would give to Mao. Whatever Chairman Mao wanted you to do, you were ready to do it. So we were all there crying and jumping up and down and shouting ourselves hoarse. In that heady summer 30 years ago, millions of young people poured into Beijing from all over China. Even the older generation who'd suffered from Mao's extreme policies in the past were caught up in the infectious enthusiasm. Mary Wong, a secondary school teacher, explains how the mood spread. When you see the red flags and when you see how emotional everybody was, you get carried away with that sort of feeling as well. And you, you just think, I should be part of that, I should belong to that. Because there's millions of people there and everybody, they, they seem to all love and, and worship Mao so much that you, you would question yourself if you were, yourself didn't feel like that. In this climate, it was easy for Chairman Mao to become a deity. He was constantly referred to as the red sun rising in the east, an image which neatly encapsulated a sense of Mao as a celestial being and of China as the dawning communist superpower. Young people vied with each other to find more extreme ways of expressing their devotion. For Zhang Yi, the answer was self-mutilation. <laughs> I cut a small hole in my chest with a penknife and pinned my Mao badge there. That way I thought when I put my clothes on, no one would be able to see it. And I would have Chairman Mao literally engraved on my heart. This personality cult did not come about by accident. Anthony Gray was a reporter based in Beijing in the early stages of the Cultural Revolution. He describes how successfully the Mao myth was cultivated. The most uh, extravagant and ridiculous language was used all the time about him in the official press and in the Red Guard newspapers. And I remember I saw him once on May Day, just by the sheerest chance, and uh, I was in a crowd in a park. Um, and I was talking to uh, members of the crowd, and I was saying, what are you hoping to see? And they said, Chairman Mao. And I said, why? And they said, we love Chairman Mao. And they really did say it in a way. I think the sort of tendency of young people to want to idolise something, be it pop singers or film stars, or in their case, only one charismatic individual in the nation, he had managed to work a great sort of spell over the people. I think he used the old... Um, admiration for China's emperors and uh, that sort of son of heaven idea was very strong I think in inculcated almost in the Chinese nature and so he was an extraordinary sort of charismatic figure and he exploited this uh, for all it was worth. But to what end? Why did Mao need to mobilize millions of young people and launch another revolution in a country which had so recently emerged from civil war and famine? In Mao's view the answer was simple. China's future was at stake. The ageing chairman felt his revolution was under threat from a creeping capitalist restoration. Wherever he looked, he saw traitors and backsliders. 
As Professor Roderick McFarker of Harvard University explains, Mao had even lost faith in the band of revolutionaries who'd battled alongside him for almost half a century. The men with whom he had won China in 1949 were most of them not able to undertake this great new revolutionary task. They'd already settled into Soviet-style routines. They didn't want revolution. So the most important thing he decided, and he said this as early as July 1964, the most important thing was to rear a new generation of revolutionary successors. And the Cultural Revolution in its most extreme phase from 66 to 68, was precisely designed to train those young people in the arduous task of making revolution. I must explain why the Cultural Revolution take place Otherwise, it, it, people can't understand. It's like an act of madness, almost as if the Communist Party wanted to commit suicide. Nian Cheng, who was imprisoned for six years during the Cultural Revolution, she sees the movement as an attempt by Chairman Mao to reassert his own control after losing ground to his Communist Party opponents in the wake of the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap, launched in 1958, was Mao's experiment in agricultural collectivization and high-speed industrial development. He created chaos and he organized the peasants into communes. Everybody was given the same amount of reward. The result was nobody wanted to do the hard work. But for a long time, nobody dared to tell Mao the truth until people no longer had anything to eat. Tens of millions starved in the three years following the Great Leap Forward. To this day, no one knows exactly how many died. The party was then and is now unwilling to reveal the true scope of the famine which its own policy errors helped to produce. But in the early 1960s, the more extreme aspects of collectivization were quietly abandoned. President Liu Xiaoqi and Communist Party General Secretary Deng Xiaoping stepped in. One of their first reforms was to restore markets in an effort to give farmers an incentive to grow grain and vegetables. Arguing over the price of an aubergine at a free market in Beijing, anathema to Chairman Mao's vision of a socialist state in which individual interests should be submerged to those of the collective. Mao had been damaged by the famine, and within the party he had to criticize his own failings. But far from concluding that his policies were mistaken, he determined instead that they'd been sabotaged by his enemies. The announcement of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's fall from power in 1964. For Chairman Mao, the event held a very personal significance, as Roderick McFarker explains. When Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, was ousted in October 1964, that set off an alarm bell in Mao's mind uh, because he was kicked out, according to the official Soviet line, for his harebrained schemes. And Mao certainly had committed more harebrained schemes upon China than Khrushchev in Russia. By this point, the two great communist powers had already fallen out publicly and irrevocably. Chairman Mao felt the Soviet Union had betrayed the socialist cause, that in the years since its revolution, the Soviet Communist Party had atrophied into an exploitative new elite. He saw signs that the Chinese party was going the same way. He felt the only way to save his revolution was by waging war against the Communist Party hierarchy itself. Mao's chosen weapon was the nation's youth, and after an education rich in ideological and patriotic exhortation, they were perfect for the task. The revolution fervor was uh, definitely very much um, in me. I think in the, in the educational system, in the, starting from uh, the split of the Russian and Chinese uh, Communist Party, I think the students, the, the learning process became much more politicized. And the competition I won in my essay was an essay how to be the successor of the revolution. 
And I remember I had all this thick rhetoric and empty slogans, and everybody loved it, and some people cried, and you know, I was very proud. And that was 65. So the education was already gearing up to a very charged class struggle preparation. Young Chinese were taught to feel that they had a special responsibility, not just to their own country, but to the world as a whole. Zhang Anxi. Now it was our generation's turn to defend China. China was the only country which wasn't revisionist, capitalist or colonialist. It may seem very laughable nowadays, but at the time we felt we were shouldering a heavy load, defending China's revolution and liberating the world. All the big slogans made a generation of us feel that the Cultural Revolution really was a war, a war to defend Chairman Mao and the new China. It was more important to pledge allegiance to the revolution and to Chairman Mao than to one's own family, as An Chi Min remembers from her school days. From the first day of my schooling, seven years old, you, know, you learned, you read, I love you, Chairman Mao, not... I love you, Papa or Mama. And you brainwashed, basically, for 18 years. And uh, looking back, you read all these things. It sounds so stupid. But at that, that time, the party was doing everything to keep us, we call it pure, purify us. So we would live for Mao's idealism, Mao's power, instead of discover our own humanity. In 1966, Chairman Mao invited the young to set themselves up in judgment over their parents and teachers, and their training gave them the confidence to do so. In schools and universities, they started writing wall posters, criticising their teachers and academic authorities. Mary Wong recalls the mood of those early days at her elite school in Beijing. I remember quite clearly that I just had my hair perned for two weeks, and the student came into the classroom and said, um, you know, your hair perm, this is capitalist and a Western uh, lifestyle. You're not allowed that. Get it straightened tomorrow or, you know, you'll be, be careful. You have to be careful of what the results will be. And were you very surprised? Because prior to that, it, always in Chinese culture, teachers uh, had a lot of respect from their pupils and there was a, an attitude that a teacher was entitled to respect. Suddenly for it to turn around and for them to be telling you what to do, that must surely have been quite shocking. It was quite shocking, but because the school that I was in, these students, their parents were in very high position. So we knew that it wasn't something very simple, that's just ordinary students being unpolite to teachers. We knew that there was a political motive behind it. The political motive was complex. The growing tension in the schools had been matched by a tightening assault on the high-level leaders who Mao perceived as his enemies. President Liu Xiaoqi and Party General Secretary Deng Xiaoping were coming under increasingly direct attack as capitalists. The young were being encouraged to spot traitors and spies round every corner. Their revolutionary fervour was whipped up with huge rallies in which they were expected to denounce their teachers. An Chimin describes her own part in humiliating her favourite teacher. When my name was called to denounce her, I, I, was, I was trembling because she, didn't, she was very strong. She didn't want to surrender, and so they physically torture her. They just raise her arm backwards, and she was in pain, and uh, I, I wasn't emotionally prepared for it. And then the party secretary come in and... Uh, whisper to me and says, Chairman Mao is watching you and we all believe that you're a brave girl. So I was able to keep reading from the sheet. I, I don't, I can't really recall what was exactly what was written. I guess I was really, I was her favorite student and, uh, and the action that I actually was denouncing her really took off the strength from her, and she was really turning gray, turning pale. And it's like you see a person aging, like in 10 years, in one second. And I was turning hysterical. 
And finally, I remember myself screaming, said, if you dare to ask me more questions, because my teacher was asking me questions and uh, in, a, in a kind of normal voice that she would use in the classroom, and I just couldn't handle that. That moment, I just busted, and I said, if you dare to ask me one more question, I'm going to use a, a needle just to stitch, stitch your lips together. And, uh, and I felt it was like a whiteout. I, I couldn't remember a thing what happened after that. It's like I went crazy. The brutalization of the young was swift and effective. In Catherine Ye's case, the struggle with her gentler instincts was brief. Well, I had a very interesting, also very painful uh, memory. That is, my first job also was to sit with the principal herself in, in her office to make sure that she's not going to run away or commit suicide. And I sat there, and she used to be this powering, very sour-looking principal. But I, later on, I learned she's one of the most dedicated teachers. But you know, you, you're 13, you, you're re really quite afraid of your principal. And he, she tried to talk to me for the first time. So she said, your mother is an American. And that was such an intimate question under such pressure. I looked at her as I was about to answer her like a pupil to a um, principal. I checked myself and said, this is no time to chit chat, you know, with a potential enemy of the revolution. So I turned hard my little face and said nothing. And I still remember I was just softening up to be another human being. You know, somebody asked you a question, and uh, I, then I thought, no, she's trying to soften my will of being revolutionary. So those are very early memories of the first days of, of the Cultural Revolution. It didn't stop at shouting abuse, shaving heads and smashing personal possessions. Physical violence was also part of the daily round of Red Guard activity. Torture and killing were commonplace. As she left home for school one morning, Mary Wong met a truck loaded with bodies. I could see that there was a girl about 15 or 16 years old standing on a pile of bodies uh, with two hands on her hip, with her head, uh, you know, high up, lifted, very proud as if to show, show off that, you know, this is what we have done, we are the revolutionists. And it just gave me a very, very chilling feeling. I tried to think in my mind, I mean, I said, a few months ago, there would have been just nice little girls sitting in the classroom. How could have, in a few months' time, become killers? I mean, at that stage, I just couldn't understand what was happening in their minds. The Red Guards were weaned on fear and paranoia. They knew that they too could suddenly be targeted as the enemy. The only safety was in being more red, more revolutionary than your neighbour. Beating up other people was part of the revolutionary test, as Jiang Anxi explains. One time on my way home, I saw some Red Guards arresting a young girl. They said she was a bad element. Whether she was or not was beside the point. There was no investigation or legal process. Someone said she was a baddie, and that was enough. So they were using their belts to beat her up. I was a Red Guard too, and my first thought was that I must express my revolutionary spirit. I took off my belt and lifted it high, as if I too were taking part in the beating. I couldn't actually bring myself to hit her, but I knew I had to look as if I was. Beating people was a symbol of revolutionary fervor. If you didn't beat people, you weren't showing a proper hatred for the enemy or a proper love for the people. In the outside world, many people were unwilling or unable to perceive this murky side of the Cultural Revolution. It was a time of student radicalism in Europe and North America. Many young people in the West identified with the mass outpouring of youthful idealism in China. Francis Wood was studying Chinese at a university in Britain at the time. China and mad Maoists and students um, running rampage and telling their professors where to get off was all rather attractive to someone who was a 1968 student in Cambridge. So I think we knew quite a lot about it. I suppose that students of Chinese probably knew more about it than many people. 
And we had the superficial view that it was, in a sort of anarchic sense, a good thing. American campuses were paralyzed by protests against the Vietnam War. And as China was supporting its communist allies in what many American students perceived as a legitimate defense against neo-imperialism, China won a lot of sympathy from students like Anne Thurston, who was at the University of California in Berkeley. Many people of my generation, including myself, were opposed to American involvement in the war in Vietnam. And I think one consequence of that was that we tended to sort of ignore or to paint a rosier picture of what was happening in China. I've, I've always suspected that another, another reason may have been the fact that I grew up in a time of when we were being taught what we called value-free social science. And you weren't really supposed to judge, or at least that's sort of one of the things I thought value-free social science meant, that you weren't really supposed to judge what other societies were doing, but rather try to understand them. So you were trying to understand why people were so angry and why they were protesting. And that had the effect of, of our ignoring the horrible human consequences of the Cultural Revolution. But while American campuses could turn a blind eye to the horrible human consequences, no one at Chinese universities could indulge in such evasions. The past was being dredged up again and again to be used as evidence. No detail was too small or too long ago in building a case against an enemy of the people, as translator Yang Xianyi found when poems written in 1960 were suddenly deployed against him. I wrote some poems defending... Khrushchev, saying that he's denouncing Stalin was very good and justified. And I left them in a feeling of a bad temper on the, purposely on the desk, on my desk, for other people to look, look at. And our party secretary copied that down. But at that time, he, she was polite to me and didn't... Uh, accuse me of anything until the Cultural Revolution starts. And as soon as that starts, they print all my black poems and started struggling against me immediately. In such a climate of paranoia, almost any kind of knowledge or expertise was suspect. By contrast, it was an article of faith that human will in the service of the revolution could overcome all physical obstacles. The absurdity of this situation was painfully recalled in the film To Live. A woman dies in childbirth because all the doctors in the hospital have been carted off to prison and re-education camp, leaving the hospital staffed by a team of young Red Guards. Their only response to the crisis is to chant a litany of ideological slogans and then to panic. Some saw Mao's assault on the intellectuals as the last revenge of a country boy on an establishment which he felt had underrated him ever since his days as a library assistant in Beijing. But Anne Thurston sees Mao's motivation as less personal. I don't know that he was really deliberately trying to destroy the intellectual class. I think he was probably also trying to transform them and to make them less elitist, more aware of the trials and tribulations of ordinary workers, peasants. I mean, very few Chinese at that time had a higher, higher education. Very few people could be considered intellectuals. And there was a sort of disdain on the part of intellectuals towards workers and, and peasants, and I think there still is today. So I think what he was really attempting to do was to, was to bring those disparate groups closer together. But the price, of course, was terrible destruction of, of the intellectuals. The language of the time was full of violence. Enemies were monsters and freaks who must be struggled against, destroyed, crushed. And by logical extension, so must all their creations. Books, music, films, photographs, antiques, anything which could remotely be deemed unrevolutionary must be smashed. 
destroy the four olds, was one of the Red Guard's favourite slogans. Ding Xueliang remembers the build-up to the great acts of revolutionary destruction he masterminded as a 14-year-old Red Guard leader in Anhui province. Radical Red Guards, like myself, would call upon people together to come to the place and to watch and to see, to support us, and to record this marvellous historical moment. In one incident, Ding Xueliang took part in the destruction of a 16th century Ming Dynasty monument, which had been erected in honor of a local student who'd come first in the nationwide imperial examinations. Hundreds of hundreds of students are there, and uh, people, students, short slogans. We had the Chairman Mao's picture in our hands, we had the so-called little red box in our hands, and uh, before we acted together to bring the, the monument down, we had uh, revolutionary songs, we had uh, slogans, we, we, had, we had all the condemnation of a traditional culture, of a traditional value, of a traditional educational system, and all this, and then we just bring them down, and then people say, oh, bring, to bring them down is not enough, we have to find uh, hammers to bring them into peace and never let anyone ha have, the, have the chance to rebuild them. It, it's like a, the holidays, the parents, the farmers uh, go to the marketplace. It's, it's kind of ceremonial, it's, it's entertaining. Libraries and temples were also legitimate targets. But on whose orders was all this destruction carried out? The highest influence came from, of course, from Chen Mao and his wife and a small group of radical assistants close to Chen Mao. Uh, they didn't order you go to a specific library on a specific day to destroy a specific titles. They didn't. But the general calling from Chen Mao, from his associates, uh, was that uh, everything old is bad. Everything bad is corrupt. Every corrupt thing should be destroyed, and it should be destroyed forever. If you don't destroy them now, then you will do a damage for the revolutionary cause. The early months of the Cultural Revolution had unleashed an orgy of destruction. It was an atmosphere in which Mao Zedong himself thrived, as Roderick McFarker points out. Being out of control from his point of view was a good thing. Mao was never in favor of routine and rules and regulations. And in particular, in this case, he wanted them to struggle, to take the initiative. It was just that uh, they never seemed to settle down. They never seemed to realize when destruction had to end and a new world had to be constructed. But in all the 10 years of revolution which followed, there was no real attempt at construction. After the first tide of frenzied enthusiasm came a spiral of chaos which brought China close to the brink of civil war. How Mao's cultural revolution failed and how China struggled to emerge from its shadow is the subject of our next programme. <laughs> Ever since their fight for survival in the 1930s and 40s, Chinese communists believed art and literature must serve the revolution. Plots and characters had to celebrate the struggle of the proletarian classes against the forces of imperialism, feudalism and capitalism. But by 1966, Chairman Mao believed Chinese socialism was locked in a life and death struggle with the forces of reaction. It wasn't enough for culture to serve the revolution anymore, it had to lead. And Mao entrusted his wife Jiang Qing with the task of creating a pure proletarian culture. For 10 years, that culture mirrored the character of its maker, extreme, irrational, vindictive. Jiang Qing's biographers trace her personality problems back to a childhood with a mother who was a prostitute and a father who was a violent alcoholic. Jiang Qing had an insecure, violent and somewhat ruthless childhood. She became given to fantasy and the theatre was her salvation. 
Professor Ross Terrell of Harvard University believes Jiang Qing's theatrical training in the Shanghai of the 1930s helps to explain the political agenda she adopted later. It was a time of crisis. The Japanese were encroaching. Shanghai was a pretty socially unjust place in many ways. So the, the left-wing movie companies that she went in, they stressed a social role for art. They stressed anti-imperialism, the Japanese especially, British too, and they stressed the strong role of will. If you were going to change China, you had to have a strong will. So as an actress, she was a great hit in these left-wing movies. One was called Old Bachelor Wong. This little audio clip of that film, where she sings of her of her loyalty to this older husband, her her tribulations with him, that's about all we have of her theatrical record in Shanghai in the thirties. <laughs> Jiang Qing had the rest of her work destroyed during the Cultural Revolution to ensure that none of it could be used against her. She was determined to use her control of culture to drive her campaign for political leadership. So how did she see her task? To take the theatre, to take opera, ballet, music and literature and fill it with a political message. This way to revivify the revolution to make people more socialist minded so jiang qing revived all her her, her left wing theatrical passions from the 1930s heroes had to be very heroic villains had to be horribly villainous dressed in rags never at the center of the stage and she had a combative streak to her personality polarize and then struggle. There was a psychological fit between Jiang Qing and this tactic of the Cultural Revolution. The corridors of the Beijing Conservatory of Music now echo with Beethoven, but in the summer of 1966, this was one of the first places to fall silent. Piano professor Zhou Guangren remembers how no one dared to touch their instruments. No music sound anymore. The conservatory was silent. Everybody uh, was just learning uh, and doing self-criticism or accepting criticism from students. So we had to come every day, every morning at the time when office hours, we still have to come to school, sit there, and read books, and then do criticism. But criticism of what exactly? Professor of Conducting Zheng Xiaoying recalls the accusations. We had to analyze our mistakes in our work of teaching or performing, because we performed a lot of classical or Chinese traditional music. We thought that we uh, popularized the bad things to the young generation. Beethoven, Mozart, Bach were all bad things, coming out of a capitalist bourgeois Western culture. Traditional Chinese opera was also bad. It was feudal and backward. The creators and performers of these so-called poisonous weeds were targeted for re-education. They were sent to the countryside to be stripped of their elitist attitudes by long years of heavy labour under military supervision. We were working in the rice fields and, um, you know, uh, we had to scrap with our own fingers into the ground 
to loosen it. And we thought perhaps it would be quite uh, clever if we have some tools to do that. And then the soldier said, no way, <laughs> because you have to, to get this education to do everything with your fingers. And that was very painful to us because for, for a pianist like me, you know, I was scraping all the time into the ground, and so I hurt my finger. Did you fear that you wouldn't be able to play again? I did not fear. I just thought that I will never play again. Because at that, during the Cultural Revolution, I thought I would never do music again, never play piano again. So when I hurt my finger, I just took it. The same fate befell artists and writers. The work they devoted their lives to was condemned. And just as painful to them, China's 4,000-year heritage of art and literature was swept aside with contempt. In its place, Jiang Qing elevated a handful of works which conformed to her own idiosyncratic vision of pure proletarian culture. Francis Wood, curator of the Chinese collection at the British Library, explains why so very few works qualified for inclusion in the revolutionary repertoire. Because nothing else was quite correct. I mean, you couldn't take anything from the past and discover that it fitted in to these incredibly strict rules. The business of having to have black characters and white characters, I fantastically good, fantastically bad, no grey characters. I mean, any work of art of any subtlety has got grey characters in it. So it was essential to sweep everything away. It's true also that, for example, a lot of things to do with the past are all politically incorrect because history had to be reinterpreted. So you couldn't use something that talked about, you know, the Dowager Empress in any terms other than absolute condemnation. History had been rewritten as cowboys and Indians. So you had nothing to lean on. You had to start again with this new pure drama and pure opera and pure fiction. <laughs> The Red Lantern, one of the eight operas which met Jiang Qing's standard for political correctness. The opera demonstrates the courage and determination of a young girl in the face of Japanese aggression. For ten years, actress Liu Chang Yu was the star of the Red Lantern. She had many opportunities to witness Jiang Qing in action. If she wanted you to do something, you just couldn't say no. If you said you didn't want to play it like that, she'd fly into a temper and say you didn't understand. She was always bringing politics into performance. For instance, sometimes I thought the part required that I cry, but she wouldn't let me. This is the part where Li Chimei goes home after her loved ones have all been slaughtered. She picks up the wine jug from which she used to pour her father's wine. She thinks of her dead father and starts crying. Now I felt I was completely immersed in the part, completely at one with Li Chimei's feelings about losing her family. But Zhang Qing said, Don't cry so much. You're supposed to be a representative of the proletarian classes. She said I wasn't enthusiastic enough. I didn't express enough hatred. Every single nuance of a production took on a political meaning, and Jiang Qing manipulated political labels to settle personal scores. If the director didn't agree with her opinion, she would say he was a revisionist, opposing the revolution in opera. In fact, he was a counter-revolutionary. And she pushed us to hold struggle sessions against him. Then there was an actor who developed his part very successfully. But it wasn't exactly according to Jiang Qing's taste. So she said he was a spy, a counter-revolutionary, 
and after that, he wasn't allowed to act again. Jiang Qing had a long memory for slights, real or imagined. Her preeminence during the Cultural Revolution allowed her to take revenge on all her enemies. China's artistic community lived in a climate of fear, and very few had the courage to challenge Jiang Qing. If you uh, wanted to do something else, it's dangerous. It uh, means that you think you can you can do something over Jiang Qing better than Jiang Qing, so that's dangerous. So people didn't do that. They just performed what Jiang Qing did. With such a small repertoire, Jiang Qing could control every aspect of a production, and she enjoyed dropping in on rehearsals to make impromptu observations about revolutionary propriety. At one point in, I think it's Xia Jiabang, the man has to get off a horse, and the actor just got off the horse to the side, and she said, that, that looks weak. How about jump over the head of the horse? So he, from the back of the theatre, she told him to do that, and that's how it ended up in the theatre. She said, that looks much stronger to get off your horse by jumping over the head. It wasn't just heroes who had to do everything in heroic style. Villains had to do everything in villainous style too. And villains had to be clearly labelled. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about opera, theatre, um, novel or even poetry. People had to be either black or white. There was this great movement against grey. A grey person, someone sort of vaguely indecisive, is absolutely no good because it might prove a role model. The peasants of China might think, I want to be ambiguous instead of being, I want to be good or I want to be bad and so on. Um, and so that even, um, even when you had stories that were based on reality, like, for example, the ghastly little sisters of the grasslands who rescued the um, communal flock in a, a sudden snowstorm, the story itself is, you know, very morally uplifting because they got frostbite, they lost their feet, but they managed to save the sheep. But in most of the versions produced for the Chinese, for the edification of, of Chinese people, this was insufficient because they were fighting against a natural enemy, the weather. And that's pretty grey, really, because it sort of could happen to anyone. It's very sort of deus ex machina. You've got to have something much... Something has got to be pointed out. So they used to introduce a class enemy who was an awful kind of evil man with a yellow face who would come, and you could tell he was a class enemy because he used to kick lambs over precipices. And he was introduced just to point up the class nature of good and evil, that weather wasn't sufficient, weather is not a class problem, but you have to have a class enemy in there somewhere. Proletarian culture produced a new generation of stars. Traditional ideas about female beauty no longer applied. An Chi Min certainly didn't have a pale skin, tiny waist and mincing walk when she was plucked from the cotton fields and groomed for movie stardom. The important thing is that this person is actually was a peasant and the person has this look that everything against traditional Chinese beauty. And I, because of carry heavy duty stuff, I was like really big muscle. And I have weather beaten wet face, skin, but they considered that I was beautiful. And then I was trained and the way they trained me was, for example, An Chi Min, come here, drink water. Show us how to drink water in a proletarian style. And I drink, take the cup and drink, and they say, stop. The way you hold the cup is wrong. Look at your little finger, it tilted up. And the correct way to drink water is to grab the mug and drink it down in one gulp and uh, wipe your mouth with two sleeves. That. And you always you know I was always have this chicken blood in, in on my shirt that I was like, you know, I I came out as a revolutionary character and just got beaten up by the going down the enemies and, and to show people that how much I have sacrificed and how strong willed I am as a communist. To the Red Guard generation of teenage revolutionaries, all of this had a certain appeal. And she was just one of millions who grew up idolising the heroines of the model operas exactly as Jiang Qing had planned. I was her product, in a way. The whole generation, the post in my bedroom since I was a teenager was all the female character that she created. And this character is very much a portrait of her own, own life. You know, these are the women of her 
uh, of her dreams, uh, who who do everything is try to save her people, and they are capable of leading men, and uh, they always have this gun in their hands and posing in the at this forty five degree. That you know, I, I was taught later on the same thing. And she could sing every one of Jiang Ting's model operas from beginning to end. And even now, 30 years later, she can still remember them. The victory song from Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy is one of her favorites. <laughs> Then the curtain closes. Once the early enthusiasm was over, the vast majority of the Chinese population did not share this enthusiasm for Jiang Qing's revolutionary repertoire, but nobody was asking them. The consumer had absolutely nothing to say about anything. It was a very repressive society. The consumer had to be jolly grateful for whatever he got, even if it was to go and see you know, Taking Tiger Mountain by strategy for the 99th time. Of course, you could say, I mean, they did expand the possibilities a bit by having you know, the book of Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy, the film of Taking Tiger Mountain by Strategy, the drama, the opera, the um, the stage version without without singing. So that, I mean, you could see the same thing in about 85 different versions, but um, it's got nothing to do with what was what might be pleasant. It's to do with what's good for you. Now, eight theatre pieces for many, for five or six years, in a nation of 900 million people, People became bored, and and people threw away their radios because there was there was nothing more to listen to. If you heard Red Detachment of Women uh, twenty times, you didn't then want to hear it for for the twenty first time. <laughs> But even in the top leadership, only one person, Deng Xiaoping, had the courage to object to Jiang Qing's cultural experiment. At one point, Deng Xiaoping criticized her theater pieces, and he said something which really summed up a lot of what ordinary people thought about politicizing the arts. He said, after, after a hard week's work, people want to go to the theater to relax and you go to the theater and watch Zhang Qing's pieces and you're on a battlefield. Even Zhang Qing didn't want to spend her evenings on the battlefield. She loved Western movies and movie stars and Greta Garbo was her favorite. So while 900 million ordinary Chinese were subjected to endless repetitions of the eight model operas, Jiang Qing herself staged private showings of films like Queen Christina. I have imagined happiness, but happiness you cannot imagine. Happiness you must feel, joy you must feel. In a dictatorship like that, the traits of personality are writ large. She loved Greta Garbo films, so Greta Garbo was not criticized. Indeed, Zhang Qing intrinsically would have been a perfect target of the Cultural Revolution. Why? She was a romantic, she was an individual, but she was Mao's wife. That status might protect Jiang Qing, but by the early 70s, it was clear it would not sustain her artistic experiment. The Cultural Revolution was running out of political steam. And while it could not be renounced while Mao was still alive, nothing new could be done in its name. China's artists, performers and writers knew that paying lip service to Jiang Qing's slogans was enough to survive the Cultural Revolution. It abused rhetoric in a way that no one has ever done before or since. I remember there was a period, a long period, when you couldn't do anything. You couldn't publish a book about traditional bamboo sword fighting. You couldn't introduce 
a performance by acrobats, you couldn't even really have a cup of tea without having to say, under the great conditions of overthrowing the rightist revisionist wind on the educational front, blah, 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 we will now see an acrobatic performance. So I think under those stultifying conditions of rightist revisionist winds on educational front, amazing mixed metaphors and inability to do anything. What, what they did at the time was really, uh, they used to sort of cloak themselves in the authority of such phrases. If you said that, you could almost do anything. This rhetorical padding may have protected the individual, but it turned the Chinese language into a blunt instrument, useless to a new generation of writers who were fumbling to express something other than ideology. Exiled poet Yang Lian. During the Cultural Revolution, the propaganda run on the state media always described Chinese life in the most glowing language. It was only when I went to the countryside that I suddenly discovered the conflict between language and reality. And this gave me a profound distrust of the language of all this state propaganda. Which explains why, when I came to write my own poetry, I felt a fundamental need to create my own language in which to express my own thoughts. Yang Lian grew up during the Cultural Revolution and says all his poetry is informed by that experience. Here's an extract from Wild Goose Pagoda, which is an attempt to place the revolution in the context of China's long history. Here I have been made to stand, immobile, for a thousand years in China's ancient capital, upright like a man, sturdy shoulders, head held high, gazing at the endless golden earth. I have stood here, immobile as a mountain, immobile as a tombstone, recording the travail of a nation. Mute, heart hard as rock, pondering in solitude, pitch black lips parted in a silent cry to the sun. Perhaps I should tell the children a tale. When Yang Lian started to write poetry, he did so in a vacuum. Apart from a few so-called revolutionary poems, which were the only things to be published at that time, there was nothing. No translated poetry and no classical Chinese poetry. It had all been banned during the Cultural Revolution. I had to grope blindly towards a form of modern poetic expression. And as a result of the Cultural Revolution, you could say the cultural trademark of my generation is that we have no culture. By the time of President Nixon's visit to China in 1972, the political paradoxes of the Cultural Revolution were plain for all to see. And if capitalist presidents were suddenly acceptable, then why not capitalist music? The London Philharmonic Orchestra was one of the first to visit, performing in Beijing in 1973. To Chinese musicians who'd been starved of classical music for seven years, it was a poignant moment. I wandered outside the theatre. <laughs> I hope I, somebody can, could take me in. <laughs> At last, uh, somebody uh, saw me. So, you have no ticket. I said, no. <laughs> and they allowed me to uh, went in and to hear all oh, that. That's wonderful. And because I already, already many years I had, I, hadn't heard such beautiful music. (laughs) 
Chinese musicians had to wait until Chairman Mao's death and the renunciation of the Cultural Revolution before they could perform such works themselves. And then Zhou Guanren could finally give her own recital of the classical works that had been banned in the conservatory for so many years. Well, I thought uh, it was the, the end of the Cultural Revolution. And at that time, we were already more aware of what was going on during the Cultural Revolution. At the beginning, we were not quite clear, and we thought perhaps it's right to do, to go through a Cultural Revolution. But at the end of the Cultural Revolution, I think nobody was really thinking that it was the right thing, that it was something wrong anyway. And so after the 76, I thought, it was not really right to stop all the classical and romantic works, not to let the students study these things, this, because this is the culture which belongs to the whole world. It's not, uh, and uh, you cannot politically put signs on, on these things. It's the treasure of mankind. So I thought the students should learn it. So the first concert I gave, I, I wanted our students to listen. As China renounced the Cultural Revolution and ventured on a period of political and economic liberalization, back came Chopin, traditional opera and classical poetry. And back too came the composers, writers and performers who'd been exiled to the countryside. As they struggled to find their voices and to express in art the sufferings of those years, so China's new leadership struggled to rebuild from the wreckage the country's political and economic life. In our fourth and final programme, we'll examine how far China has now come to terms with the ten dark years of the Cultural Revolution. With the Cultural Revolution, Chairman Mao had hoped to mobilize the population of China in a single-minded crusade for a socialist future. No child was too young to join in. But it wasn't long before the spirit of idealism and common purpose had vanished, to be replaced by violence and chaos. For impassioned young Red Guards like Catherine Ye, this came as a terrible shock. I turn around and these kids that I have originally uh, led into the movement uh, started to try to beat me up. And at that moment, I really almost lost my nerve with fright and, uh, and bitterness and, and rushed home. And then they punctured my bicycle, so I had to walk home. They spit me all over with, with uh, spittle. So it was quite a shock. The revolution began to devour its own children. Historian Anne Thurston says wave upon wave of persecution left no one safe. People who were persecutors in one stage became victims in the next, as in particular what was happening is that parents of these young people who were participating in the attacks were coming under attack, and once your father came under attack or your mother came under attack, you too came under attack. So the targets just widened and widened and widened. For want of any other useful criterion of revolutionary rectitude, Family background quickly became a yardstick by which people could be measured and found wanting. Any trace of capitalist or nationalist sympathies, no matter how many generations earlier, was enough to destroy every member of a family. George Moe, for example, had the kind of ancestry which made him an easy target. I think before the Cultural Revolution, I, although my father was neither a landlord nor a capitalist, but my grandfather was. And uh, my classmates had attributed my backwardness to the, uh, my grandfather's generation. And I uh, tried to uh, find that connection uh, within myself. There was a slogan called, if you, your father is revolutionary, then you are a hero. And if your father is re reactionary, then you are a son of a bitch. 
And that's what very insulting. And、uh, people who were、uh, from bad family background were really discriminated against everywhere. The theories of class and family background didn't just turn the Red Guards against one another; they were designed to undermine the loyalty of children to their parents. And Chi Min tried to educate her family in the manner she'd learned from the upstairs neighbors. I wanted to organize a、uh, mass seminar at home. I was just imitating what people did upstairs. Before dinner, they would have these ceremonies. Is you know,、uh, let's say long live Chi Min Mao. And、uh, read a par- cup of paragraph from a quotation book and sing some Mao songs, and then after dinner, and they would do it again. And I thought it was really new and it was really exciting. And I went to propose the same thing to my father, and he says, "I had enough in my unit. I don't want that in my home." And I thought he doesn't love Mao. I thought something's wrong with him. And Chi Min kept that secret doubt to herself. She didn't go the way of many children who denounced their fathers, hung placards round their necks, and jeered at them in struggle sessions. Some even disowned their parents to escape the curse of a bad family background. Writer and translator Yang Xianyi tells the story of his only son. In the early days of the Cultural Revolution, he was very enthusiastic. He was one of the Red Guards. And then when we were arrested, he just and he got suspected too, so he lost his mind. He couldn't take it. That that was a very big loss for us. And when you say he lost his mind, what 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 happened? Well, he gone more or less crazy. He insisted that he was not our、uh, son and.、Uh, He was the son of some English person or something like that, and、uh, he wants to go away. And so, they don't. He committed suicide. Suicide was the final choice for many who could not withstand the enveloping hatred and unremitting despair that the Cultural Revolution now represented. It was almost impossible for an individual to survive with dignity intact. The wife of dissident journalist Liu Binyan was forced to denounce him and to cut herself off from him. Sometimes I wrote、uh, a, a small piece of paper. I, I wrote to her that、uh, please believe me, you know, I'm innocent. I put that、uh, piece of paper on her bicycle somewhere, you know,、uh, wouldn't be discovered by other people. But still, her trust、uh, on me became shaking, so it was painful. If the Cultural Revolution had created anything to justify the anguish it was causing, it might have held the loyalty of the young. But the revolution created nothing, and only six months after they'd screened their allegiance to Chairman Mao in Tiananmen Square, Red Guards like Jiang Anxi were already beginning to ask themselves what it was all for. So many you see, not only your own eyes, you see all the teachers. With your own eyes, you see all your teachers, your parents, your fellow pupils, the neighbors in your street, the old people, all of them, one by one, locked up and beaten. Some of them beaten to death. By the end of 1966, I already had many doubts about the Cultural Revolution, and it wasn't just me. Lots of people felt the same way. You suddenly asked yourself, "Is this revolution?" The people who have been called class enemies, like your father and mother, who've given their all for the revolution, do they really want to destroy the revolution? You started to doubt. By 1967, the conflict wasn't confined to the Red Guards. The surviving Communist Party hierarchy and the People's Liberation Army were also heavily involved, with power struggles going on inside and between these different networks. In the capital, the lid was kept on the powder keg. The British reporter Anthony Gray was just about to be arrested and imprisoned for two years, but he remembers the peculiar mood of the time. There was always this very strong element of control and manipulation. The demonstrations against the embassies were very much that. The crowds would march. There would be a person marching at the side, reading off the slogans one by one, and the other people would be chanting them. They might be knitting or even reading a newspaper in between. It was very false, and sometimes people were surrounded in the streets, and they would be 
um, spat upon and they would be uh, fists flourished in their face, but they would always stop an inch from the chin. There was a lot of symbolic stuff. And I think the fact that um, I wasn't killed, um, that no British diplomats were killed that summer, was as a result of this, this mixture of chaos and control. But of course, the British embassy was burned down and the uh, British diplomats were inside and had to come out and run the gauntlet of um, 10,000 Red Guards who beat up and, uh, and interfered with males and females. So, you know, when I think one was knocked unconscious, but uh, it might, in any other country of the world, there might have been a lot of foreigners killed in Peking that year. Minister of Defence Lin Biao lashing the crowds into a frenzy and exhorting them to smash counter-revolutionaries and traitors. The Red Guard factions and factory workers took his words to heart. In some places, the result was civil war. Catherine Yeh and a friend were among the millions of teenagers roaming the countryside in search of revolutionary experience when they suddenly found themselves getting drawn into battle in Chengdu, the capital of southwest Sichuan province. We were just having some noodles and so on. There was a lot of uproar. And the people said, come on, come on, we've got to get into the truck. We've got to go and support the, the revolutionaries. And I've forgotten what faction that was at the time. So we all got on the truck, and somebody gave me a spear. As I held this spear, and the truck went on and on and on into, in these no-man's-land fields. And all of a sudden, I said, oh, my God, I'm going to die. <laughs> For what? I'm not quite sure. I was ready, I was ready to turn back if there was a chance, and we were like marching to death. Many less fortunate than Catherine were indeed marching to their deaths, and after the carnage, she found herself in a ghost city. I was like half the city was empty. Midnight, two people came back, and then, you know, one o'clock, one person came back, and two o'clock, two more person came back, and that was it. And what, and had, the, what had happened to everybody else? They died. They were wounded. Every single place was a, a battlefield, wounded a hospital. All the doorways had people lying there with wounds. And we were ter terribly freaked out. And um, one afternoon, uh, we looked at each other. We said, we're going home. With the connivance of military backers happy to use Red Guards and factory workers to fight their battles by proxy, it wasn't long before the teenage revolutionaries had graduated from kitchen knives and spears to a full armoury of battlefield weapons. Ding Xueliang inventories the firepower his group had at its disposal after a raid on the local military depot. <laughs> the, all, the, all the weapons, all the weapons the Chinese army used at that time were for us. Because we break the gates, we break the warehouse of a weapon, of a weapon system. We got uh, uh, handy guns which were modeled after the Russian, the Russian uh, uh, weaponry system. And we got the uh, semi-automatic uh, rifles, we got the automatic rifles, we got machine guns, we got small cannons, we got all of them. Myself, I got two handy guns and one uh, semi-automatic -automat rifle. Such firepower made hideous casualties inevitable, and not just among the enemy. Excitable teenagers often shot their own comrades and innocent bystanders by accident. I saw him with my own eyes of a young boy at my age whose name is Jim, Mr. Jim. He, when he got a hand, handgun from the from army, he quickly took it and ran on the street. He didn't know the handgun was loaded, so he pointed the handgun like a toy to another boy about four and five years old, and then just pull the bullet out blood from a boy's breast. Another pointless death to add to the total. By the summer of 1967, the collective madness had reached fever pitch, and in southwest Guangxi region, it had spilled over into grotesque acts of revolutionary piety. The writer Zhang Yi has done some chilling research on the outbreak of cannibalism. <laughs> It started with beating people to death on a large scale. Even then, people felt they hadn't adequately expressed their class hatred, hadn't made their class stand clear enough. But if you ate the class enemy, you would be expressing extreme hatred, the most profound hatred. It was enough that one person should take the lead, 
then this cannibalism was unavoidable and spread wider and wider. Everyone wanted to express extreme hatred for the class enemy. So in the end, it turned into a kind of insanity. This insanity was not confined to remote regions and primitive peoples. According to official documents, cities and even schools were involved. But when Zheng Yi interviewed some of those who'd taken part in the atrocities, he found them unrepentant. Take, for example, the official who'd given the orders for a boy to be beaten to death. His liver was then cut out, boiled and consumed by his murderers. He said historical factors were to blame. He didn't want to accept personal responsibility. It was all class hatred, eliminating class enemies. Nothing to do with him personally, he said. As for eating human flesh, he'd done that before, when he was a communist guerrilla during the Civil War. He'd eaten the flesh of a nationalist spy. He told me they'd captured the spy, cut him open while he was still alive, taken out his liver and eaten it roasted. Civil war, industrial unrest and cannibalism were not Chairman Mao's objectives when he launched the Cultural Revolution. And by 1968, both he and the revolution's chief beneficiary, Defence Minister Lin Biao, decided the chaos had gone far enough. Lin Biao was now the anointed successor to Mao, and the army, under his control, seemed to be the only force which could restore the country to order. So with Chairman Mao's approval, the Red Guards were disbanded, and millions of troublesome adolescents sent down to the countryside to undergo re-education at the hands of the peasants. The East is Red, played by Ji Fang on her return to Lodzi Zhuang, the village where she spent two years being re-educated through labor. Then her mouth organ was her only source of entertainment after a hard day in the fields. I'm sorry, I cannot play it uh, very well because I didn't uh, play it uh, more than 20 years. <laughs> I should practice it again. <laughs> Lo Zhuang, set in a low-lying barren landscape to the east of Beijing, boasts only a small fish farm and a few rows of caged birds bred for the dinner tables of the capital. Before we came here, nothing here, only reed bed and empty land. The 250 urban youth started by baking their own bricks and building their own dormitories. Then they got to work on the fish ponds. When we came here, we uh, we start uh, labor work here. We dig uh, fishing pools uh, by ourselves. Well, we can now see about six or eight fish pools in mm -hmm. front of us, and each mm -hmm. is as about, about as big as a, uh, as a football pitch. Did you dig all of these? No. Uh, I think I remember we only dig uh, two. Now, at that time, you were about 19 years old. Were you used to hard physical labor like this? No, never. Especially in the winter, very cold. The earth is uh, very hot, very solid, because the water became ice. The boy used a pickaxe, uh, dig the earth, and uh, the girl pushed the wheelbarrows. So what was the theory behind all of this? Why were you urban children made to come here and do all this physical work? Ah, because uh, we should learn from the farmers, from the workers, uh, from soldiers. Uh, things they have uh, uh, lots of experience. They know how to grow vegetable and rice, and they know how to make a machine. Uh, they know how to find with enemy. But uh, we are so young, so we don't know anything. So we should uh, learn from them and uh, get uh, all of this experience. China's farmers had escaped the worst excesses of the Cultural Revolution. While ideological battles raged in the cities, they got on with the age-old physical struggle for survival. 
but villages near towns and big cities were inevitably drawn into the mayhem. In Daoling Jian, to the northwest of Beijing, Jiang Tong remembers the mood. We had to discuss whether the country might change colour, turn traitor to the revolution, stage a counter-revolutionary coup, that kind of thing. But you didn't know where these problems might spring from, so you had to discuss it. What you'd done in the past, what you thought, what you were going to do in the future, it all had to be discussed. The masses had to see whether you had any attitude problems or any problems in your background. If your confession was unclear, they'd get angry with you and accuse you of being dishonest. While the farmers were grappling with the complexities of revolutionary ideology, the newly arrived city children were trying to come to terms with the shocking realities of rural life. I remember one day I uh, went to the field together with uh, peasants and while working and uh, I digged out uh, the dead body of a female infant. Uh, she looked like uh, almost alive and apparently was just killed uh, right after the birth. There's also a tradition people, I think in, in Chinese culture, that uh, female belongs to eventually someone else, and only the son will inherit uh, and will pass on the family's name and everything. And that's why quite a lot of female babies were killed right after they were born. And that was indeed a part of um, learning about the countryside and the, the, the uh, peasant's life uh, in China. But for George Mo, youthful romance and a rich diet of reading mitigated the grimmer aspects of life in the countryside. I had a, a circle of friends, so we had the channel to exchange books, and essentially we could read any books that were published in China. And we actually read those books in that circle in a systematic way, you know, one writer after another, and exchange ideas and often held uh, informal, you know, salon meetings, and uh, really had a great time. Also, that's the period that we were young, and so we fell in love, and in a very romantic way, under the influence of uh, a lot of romantic novels. But, you know, things indeed uh, uh, went wrong for me. My girlfriend's father considered me to be very dangerous, and... <laughs> So he did a lot of things to make sure that I would break up with his daughter, and that was really a big shock. Uh, I, I almost uh, did not recover from that loss. And since then, I decided not to read any romantic novels and switched to studying mathematics and physics. Well, that may sound like an average tale of adolescent trauma, but for many, time in the countryside was more like a prison sentence. Anchi Min hated the farm she was sent to in the barren salt marshes outside Shanghai, a place she later described in her book Red Azalea. It's a wasted land. You see all these weeds, like so high. It's like two people size high. It's after one season, after I grow rice and cottons, I realized that it's not like Mao said, that manpower can conquer this land. I my back was injured and I saw the, on my knees all bloody and um, I was on my knees 14 hours a day and my my neck here is, is was bleeding because of the heavy load and all that and the cotton was about <laughs> about uh, four inch high the grinding hardship and misery of this rural exile quickly sapped the revolutionary zeal of the Red Guard generation, along with the experience of corruption, cynicism and hypocrisy. Within two farming seasons, An Chi Minh's faith in the Cultural Revolution had been completely annihilated. I couldn't stand up. I went to the farm hospital and they gave me acupuncture. And the doctor would say that you should go and rest. And I said, I need your permission. You have to give me a slip. And he says, no. And I, later on, I found out that he was only allowed to issue three slips per day. And he usually would give all these permissions to tractor drivers who can bring him sugar or salt, all these kind of things. 
he wouldn't give it to me. And one day was that was storming and I couldn't walk. I remember that moment and I said, God, you know, only if you can cure my back, I would have no complaint. I am willing to be the peasant to stay here to work for for the rest of my life. But if it was hard for these urban youth, farmer and writer Bill Hinton thinks their story has been told often enough. He witnessed the impact of the Cultural Revolution in a village in Shanxi province, and he puts more emphasis on the contribution the educated youth were able to make to their rural communities. The youth going to the countryside were of great help to the countryside. We saw the same in Longbo. Longbo had 70 educated youth who uh, in 71, when I was there, they were living in the village. They ran a magazine, they were responsible for the slogans on the walls, they got into uh, helping with the village accounts, and uh, some of them became teachers in the village school, and uh, all the things that, uh, that they had to offer, the village tried to make use of. That's not the way Chi Feng remembers it in Lo Zhuang village. No, <laughs> no, we, I don't think we teach them anything. They, they think we are the people to be taught. They are teacher. So that was surely a wasted opportunity because they could have learned something from you at the same time as you were supposed oh, to be learning. Oh, in that time, the works and the farmers and the soldiers, they are hero. They are the god. But uh, we, we never think we, we can teach them. But now they, they said we teach each other. <laughs> Before, we don't have this conception. <laughs> And from the farmer's side, Jiang Tong says sending down the urban youth was all very well in principle, but in practice, they weren't up to much. We peasants felt they should come to the countryside for a spell. Otherwise, they would never understand the difference between a wheat stalk and a leek. Some didn't even know how to use a rake or a sickle. So they should come for a year or two, and then they can go off and do whatever they like. They said they were coming here to settle down, but actually they were just idling away their time, and as soon as they had the opportunity to go back to the city, they took it. You had to force them to do any work. Chairman Mao opening the Communist Party Congress in 1969, a chance to celebrate what were described as the great triumphs of the Cultural Revolution. He may have thought sending the Red Guard generation down to the countryside was a good way to cool them down and restore order to the cities. But in the process, he destroyed their faith, both in him and his revolution. In the privacy of their own thoughts, this disillusioned generation was groping for other rules to live by. For An Chi Min, the answer was a secret romance. In a way, there was a secret, sort of like a love affair, that makes me think that it was, it makes me feel better than what we talk about, you know, communism and socialist. Mm. And this kind of personal intimacy was much more what I needed, and that makes me happy. So the whole red world was collapsing around us. And then where our, activi our activity becomes very, very dangerous. So if you had fallen in love with somebody else, then that would have been an act of betrayal against Mao. Right. And is that how you felt about it? When you first started falling in love with somebody else, with another human being, as opposed to with Chairman Mao, did you yourself feel that conflict, that you were in conflict with your own faith in a way? No, it was the faith, all of a sudden, faith doesn't even exist. It was so fragile that our faith became so laughable. One kiss. Revolutionary fervor vanished and was replaced by profound cynicism. Ding Chue Liang. Many red guards 
began to realize that they were used for some purpose, some hidden purpose, and the, the cultural revolution was not exactly as pure, as, as glorious, as, as official statement by Chen Mao, uh, trying to convince you believe. At this stage, that was already in late 1968 or earlier 69. Many red guards began to realize that they were used as tools for some other purposes, and they were betrayed by Chen Mao, by Chen Mao's people. In real terms, the Cultural Revolution was now over, but it could not be renounced while the man who launched it was still alive. And meanwhile, Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, seized the opportunity to launch her own revolution in the world of the arts. In next week's program, we'll examine this experiment, the most extreme attempt to reshape culture the world has ever seen. Chairman Mao died on the 9th of September 1976, and with him died the Cultural Revolution. Throughout China, there was a public outpouring of grief. But after 10 years of ideological manipulation, people had become good at hiding their real feelings, and it was hard to tell how much of the mourning was genuine. Writers Liu Binyan and An Chi Min. So many, many people lost the trust on, on Mao Zedong. And when Mao Zedong died, many, many people didn't shed tears, you know. On my heart, there was a voice, ah, oh, thank God, you finally died. At that moment, I, I had no tears, and everybody is screaming, and I, I, I moved my fingers, I opened my finger a little to see how other people was doing, and I saw my little friend, Zhang Chen, the actress, she was watching me, that she wants to know that if I was crying, real crying or not. So we were kind of, later on now it became a joke, I said, you didn't cry, she said, you didn't cry. But we were, I was suffering from not being able to cry, not being able to perform. It was a big national performance. And did you think at that point, perhaps the Cultural Revolution is going to be over soon? No, we thought the sky's going to fall. How can China run? without Mao. As it turned out, China could run very well without Chairman Mao. And 20 years later, although his memory is still revered and disco versions of his songs of praise still hit the charts, Mao himself is more pop icon than living ideological force. Ten years of cultural revolution had been more than enough. As Anthony Gray, who'd reported on the movement's early stages and then been locked in solitary confinement, knew from personal experience. I think when Deng Xiaoping decided to open China to the West and to Western trade, I think he recognised it was an exhausted nation. It was completely exhausted by political campaigns and living on nothing but promises, and well, not even promises, but just living on exhortation and, uh, and heroism, which didn't really benefit any individual. I think he realised uh, there was this desire for a better life, and I think that was the sort of great engine for what's happened in China since. So 30 years after the launch of the Cultural Revolution, China is richer, better fed and more tolerant. But it's not so tolerant that it can look with equanimity on its recent past. Under Deng Xiaoping, no one is invited to discuss that past. And worse than that, as far as public platforms go, no one is allowed to. Dr. Xu Youyu is one of a handful of unofficial historians of the Cultural Revolution. He tried to publish a series of articles to coincide with this year's anniversary. But like every other researcher in the field, he met a wall of censorship. The, the Cultural Revolution happened 30 years ago. It ended 20 years ago. During this time, I mean from that time up to now, we should do a lot of things to study cultural revolution, to study their purpose, their outcome. But there is nothing. No conference, no meeting, no symposium. 
So nothing. And why is that? Why do the authorities refuse to let you discuss this subject openly? Not any explanation, but I think Cultural Revolution is a scandal for the Communist Party. They say it's a fault of Gang of Four, but in fact they know it's their fault, not only Gang of Four at Chairman Mao. The hearing began with witnesses giving highly emotional accounts of how they'd been imprisoned and tortured, allegedly at Madame Mao's instigation. As the proceedings continued, she became visibly more angry. Facing the ruin of her dream to rule China, Jiang Qing was defiant at the Gang of Force trial in 1980. But she was an easy target. And the following year, the Cultural Revolution itself was on trial, along with its late mastermind, Chairman Mao. Mao was declared guilty of gross mistakes. But he was still the founder of Communist China. 70% right and 30% wrong, according to the party's reckoning. He could hardly be written off completely by men who still claim to belong to the same revolutionary tradition. So a line was drawn under the whole 10-year episode. The Cultural Revolution was over, and with its 1981 resolution on questions of history, the party had given its verdict. The issue was now closed. Professor Roderick McFarker of Harvard University. What they didn't do, I think, in that resolution... And what I think that we in the West can still uh, help in doing is to take apart the details and to analyze more deeply the way in which Mao plotted the whole cultural revolution. Uh, because I think that what isn't clear but from the Chinese account, the way in which step by step uh, he took apart the top ranks of the party before launching the Cultural Revolution. And we're only now beginning to be able to put it together because the Chinese themselves, while they issue material which is relevant to that appraisal, do not make that appraisal themselves. Most of Chinese scholars studying Cultural Revolution, they know nothing about the achievements by Western scholars. So I must introduce their achievement to Chinese scholar. I, I often tell my colleagues, you do something about cultural revolution in the 90s, but the Western scholars did it in the 70s, and they did it much better than yours. So you must first, you must know what they did. Then we do this based on their achievements. This is the history section of quite a small, um, rather academic bookshop. And uh, it starts at the very top there with some rather heavy-looking volumes on uh, 5,000 years of human history, a several-volume study, Cambridge study of Chinese history, uh, a dictionary of the thought of Confucius. Um, but I can't see anything that really uh, goes in to Chinese modern history or the period that we're particularly interested in, the Cultural Revolution, there seems to be nothing at all. Mm. According to this assistant, the bookshop stocks no works on the Cultural Revolution, despite the fact that quite a lot of people come looking for them. I did finally find one modern history book with 150 or so pages on our period, but when I looked more closely, I found it was written by an American. Lessons in Modern History at a Beijing Secondary School. The teacher, Zhang Shuyun, reads aloud from the standard school textbook. This passage describes how Chen Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966, how he attacked the Communist Party hierarchy and targeted his political rivals with allegations of capitalist tendencies. The textbook represents the official line, but Zhang Shuyun says it's open to a certain amount of interpretation. I think this presents no great problem to us teachers. I myself lived through the Cultural Revolution, and I can see very clearly the damage it did. The children themselves know something about this period of history from their own parents. 
and in class we can talk about it very objectively, very frankly. And among the 14 and 15 year olds in the history class, there's a range of opinion on the Cultural Revolution. My mother was sent down to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution, which was a big stimulus to her in many ways. When she was 15 or so, just the same age as we are now, she was already self-sufficient. I don't know whether she was a Red Guard or not. She did tell me she once went to meet Chairman Mao in Tiananmen Square, but I'm not clear about whether she was a Red Guard. Our textbooks have a lot of details about the things that happened during the Cultural Revolution. Students defied their teachers, they wrote posters denouncing them, they shaved their teachers' heads. That kind of thing was really terrible. It's very disrespectful to teachers. We couldn't behave like that nowadays. I think the Cultural Revolution was a very bad period in our history. It actually paralysed China's cultural development. Intellectuals were all brainwashed. They weren't allowed to study and had to go to the countryside to do hard labour instead. The result was that people became very ignorant. A rather drunken trip down memory lane at the Black Earth restaurant. The walls are plastered with posters of revolutionary heroes and photos of idealistic urban teenagers standing shoulder to shoulder with peasants and soldiers. This is the kind of place the Red Guard generation come to mull over their shared past and to make grumbling comparisons between the teenagers they were 30 years ago and their own teenage children today. We lost so much. It's not something you can sum up in a couple of sentences. We lost our golden age the time in a person's life when he should be learning the most. So I was a victim, my youth was wasted, but I'm not a complainer and I'm not on the rubbish heap either. My education didn't stop when I went out to work. I went to vocational college when I was 30. Now I'm a graduate. And although all that effort is of no use to me now, it's for the benefit of my son, for the next generation. I want my daughter to do well, but I try not to pressure her. It's my wife who makes such high demands on her. Usually her schoolwork is quite good, but she's just done very badly in this year's exams, and her mother was very angry because it means she'll only get into an ordinary middle school. All the parents of our generation have very high expectations of their children. The children don't care. When it comes to exam time, the parents are more uptight than the children. The cultural residue of the revolution goes beyond a nostalgic sing-song. In the 1980s, China produced a new generation of filmmakers who astonished the world with the depth of their artistic perception and the urgency of their message. One of the most famous of them is Chiang Kai-ge, and he says the shared experience of idealistic fervour, disillusion and exile is the hallmark of his generation. Cultural revolution make us so different. You know, we all believe that there is something for us, not for anybody else, to tell people. You know, the reason I'm still making a film because there's something I want to express. That's the point. Chiang Kai-ge's most famous film, Farewell My Concubine, covers an epic sweep of modern Chinese history through the lives of two traditional opera singers. (laughs) 
One of the heroes, carried away by the mass hatred and fear which had overtaken his world with the onset of the Cultural Revolution, betrays his partner in a harrowing struggle session. I think in my film, the point, the major point I made, the important point I made, is that I really believe that we need individualism. You know, because we used to believe in uh, collective. We always say, "Oh, if you have a better collective, then you can you can have better, you know, individuals." I don't believe so. So that's why you see a lot of revolutions here. I mean, in the last hundred years, too many revolutions. But I, I can't say, you know, nothing has changed. But the change is not that much. So we sacrifice our personalities, the individuals, in order to build up a beautiful society. I don't believe this is logical. More reenactment of the horror of the Cultural Revolution in Zhang Yimou's film To Live. A mother grieves for a daughter who's dying in childbirth because the doctors who might have saved her have all been imprisoned for their bourgeois sins. Zhang Yimou is best known internationally for films set in feudal China, but he says all his work is informed by the experience of growing up during the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution gave full reign to all aspects of human nature. Our worship of our leaders, for example, our capacity for faith, our violence in struggle, and through political faith, the loss of other aspects of human nature. Many things were distorted, many others were freed. Things that had been bottled up for a long time erupted. So to sum it up, the Cultural Revolution provided us with an opportunity to better understand mankind and understand ourselves. But the filmmakers all agree that such understanding doesn't come in one simple formula. Jiang Wen made In the Heat of the Sun, a coming-of-age film about adolescent street kids during the Cultural Revolution. Here, the mood and message are completely different from the more sombre offerings of Jiang Yimou and Chen Kaige. Jiang Wen says that's precisely the point. We are not a generation. We're different generations. There's ten years between us. And if you spoke to someone ten years younger, you'd get a different viewpoint again. I certainly have a valid point of view. I was born in 1963, after all, and I grew up alongside the Cultural Revolution. My fate is intertwined with it, and I guess my character, my world view, are all closely related to it. Be that as it may, the Cultural Revolution is no longer a legitimate subject matter for filmmakers. They're under the same ban as the academics. Three years after it was made, for example, Jiang Yimou's To Live still hasn't been shown publicly in China. My film is still banned. Ordinary people still can't see it. I can't see any problem with the film, but the government is unwilling to allow anything which discusses the Cultural Revolution. There's no way to shoot such a film nowadays. The script simply wouldn't be approved. So you just have to put it to one side for the time being. First do the things you can do. One of the things you can do turns out to be a contemporary story of urban lowlife, wry, cynical, mildly alienated. Or if you're Chiang Kai-ge, the art of the possible lies in a 2,000-year-old legend about intrigues at the court of one of China's early emperors. But Chiang Kai-ge still hasn't turned his back on the Cultural Revolution and the Red Guard generation to which he belongs. I will be very much willing to make a film about Red Guards how they got involved into the Cultural Revolution, you know, what they did, why they did it, you know, 
why they they are so hated by you know the older generation peoples and I mean I, I think they did something you cannot just criticize them you know they are teenagers they had dreams so I want to make a film about Red God if I can and do you, do you can you foresee any time in the you know in the foreseeable future when it would be possible for you to make such a film well definitely before I die yes I'm sure <laughs> Before I die is not good enough for Jiang Wen. He wants to focus on the Cultural Revolution yesterday, today and tomorrow. I don't want to adjust anything. I just feel the Chinese people are inclined to forget things too easily. They're also ready to accept whatever they're told as gospel. There's never any discussion. There are only conclusions. And if we have such a simplistic response to this 10-year movement, then it's possible for such a revolution to take place again. If we adopt oversimplistic solutions to one mistake, we may make even bigger mistakes in future. That's a view many of China's artists and writers share. But for poet Yang Lian, the sense that there might be a recurring pattern to Chinese history came only after a rude political shock administered in 1983. After 1976, people hoped that the Cultural Revolution was over. With Chairman Mao dead and Hua Guofeng and then Deng Xiaoping in power, people took the view that the Cultural Revolution had been a peculiar kind of nightmare. But with the campaign against spiritual pollution, the newspapers and television broadcasts suddenly filled up with all that familiar and terrifying language and ideology, just like in the Cultural Revolution. And the intellectual community was thrown back into the despair of the worst days of the Cultural Revolution. But whereas before they had been following blindly, this time they were open-eyed. So suddenly they realized that the Cultural Revolution wasn't a short-term, one-off phenomenon. It had deeper roots, roots which must be faced up to. Others kept faith with the new style leadership of Deng Xiaoping throughout the 1980s. But the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy demonstrations in 1989 provided another defining moment. And when Deng used the army to kill hundreds of students on the streets of the capital, Writer Zheng Yi concluded that China's new communist leaders were no better than the old. He'd been slowly uncovering evidence of mass cannibalism during the Cultural Revolution, but concealing it to avoid humiliating China's leadership. At the time, I thought these things were very shocking. But since the Communist Party was trying to introduce reforms, I didn't want to embarrass them. I thought writing a factual piece would be too stark and cruel, so I intended to write a piece of fiction. But then came the massacre of 1989. I came to a deeper understanding of the essence of communist rule. I completely despaired of it and I decided to write a factual account to make people fully aware of the cruel events which had taken place under the communists. Not everyone shares this sombre view of the Cultural Revolution as a tragedy waiting to repeat itself under a leadership irretrievably sunk in blood. Jiang Anxi says some good things have come out of the experience. Before the Cultural Revolution, Chinese people were mentally so inflexible. They were completely governed by a superstitious faith in one ideology, one individual. The Cultural Revolution finally destroyed this feudal faith in rule by one person. And without this breakthrough, the past 20 years would be unthinkable. The policy of economic reform just wouldn't have been possible. So although many things were destroyed during the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution, it also opened a new historical era. The Chinese finally learned to have their own thoughts, opinions and ideals. Anthony Gray agrees that Chairman Mao's was the last of the personality cults. By putting all the people under so much pressure and traumatising them so deeply, I think he removed the last vestiges of real respect that they had for him. And I think 
he helped make them realize that they couldn't ever trust the leadership entirely again because they had jeopardized, the, the leadership had jeopardized their lives so completely that they began to think it out for themselves. That's my impression that uh, he achieved exactly the opposite result to that which he intended. But if the revolution had psychological benefits, it also had its psychological costs. Francis Wood, curator of the Chinese collection at the British Library. If one talks about things like respect for the past or interest in the past, I think that's, that's very low in China, and it's a great pity. I mean, I think that interest in sort of the traditional culture is very, very restricted to a tiny minority. And you can see that, for example, in things like, you know, I mean, very physically, in like the wreck of the cities. You know, that there is absolutely no town planning at all, that um, a six-lane motorway has been driven through the middle of Suzhou, which is recognised by UNESCO as one of the prettiest cities in the, in the world, but not by Chinese planners, who have, as I say, destroyed the centre. I mean, there is just no sensitivity, really, to the past. And I think that's a lot to do with the Cultural Revolution. In the Cultural Revolution, the past was uniformly a bad thing. There was nothing to be got from it. And whilst you might have had, you might have hoped, perhaps, for a sort of reversion to a kind of sentimentality about the past is one of the things that hasn't come back, and I think it's partly to do with the fact that people were so badly educated. So I think it's an enormous loss to China in many ways. One of China's best-known journalists, Liu Binyan, says there's worse yet. The worst uh, consequence of the Cultural Revolution, in my opinion, is the degradation, moral degradation, the loss of the ideal of the people. So many people dehumanized. They can kill just for some money. Even if tomorrow morning we will have a perfect democratic uh, government, how can you deal with the people who listen to nobody, to no authority, you know? And there's no standard, there's no rule of the behavior of uh, so many, many people. But what of the teenage generation who defined the Cultural Revolution? Thirty years on, some are consumed by remorse for the violence and destruction they inflicted. Ding Chue Liang, for example, has tried to make up for the damage he did to his school library 30 years ago. When I, for the first time, I returned to my hometown, to my middle school, I, I, I carried many volumes of books purchased by myself as gifts to my, to my, to my middle school. One of the chief reasons I purchased these books, I, I, I traveled so far, was that I myself participated in the destruction of the library. Because what we did, students today, no longer can benefit from the cultural treasury. We did a lot of things, we can say that we should do a lot of things, a lot of things, a lot of things. I regret the things we did. There are many things we did to our teachers, to our society, to our country that we shouldn't have done. But all of that was a result of our education, a result of being manipulated by others. I don't regret my enthusiasm. I don't regret my ideals. I still hope for a better life for the Chinese people. But my strongest conviction about these 10 years of cultural revolution is that we must go on talking about it every day, every month, every year. If we don't talk about the cultural revolution all the time, it could happen again. Without a proper respect for law, China could still blindly follow the thought of one individual, like Chairman Mao. If there's any common view among those who lived through the cultural revolution, it's this. Don't make the 10-year tragedy taboo. Don't stop talking about it. And above all, don't make the mistake of thinking that you can dismiss it out of hand and move on. The last word to a former Red Guard, Catherine Ye. I have always maintained that uh, it's very, very hard to uh, measure the spiritual gains and loss of revolution for a nation. But I always get very, very uh, distressed because there is a state policy on the Cultural Revolution which is all bad. And somehow the whole nation and, and consequently the whole world has a, has a very, very one-sided understanding of the Cultural Revolution. I think there's many, many stories, like the French Revolution. I think it would take some many, many generations to understand this very idealistic and cruel and tumultuous time.